The most valued commodity in 21st century America is time. Think about it. We all identify with the guy in the bumper here that's got more stuff on his schedule in his phone than he can keep. In fact, to respond to an invitation, he's got to delete something he's already said yes to. I get more invitations than I can sneeze at. I got four this week to sign up to go see resorts. Now, I don't know how I got on the resort free weekend list this week, but I'm on it. Have you been on those? I mean, the deal where they say, hey, we'll give you three days. You just got to listen to 90 minutes of extreme pressure to buy one of our units. And other than that, it'll be okay. I was on that list this week, and there are some invitations. It's just easy to delete. It's easy to say no to. But there are others that require time and our attention, like when God himself invites us to something. When God says, I want to interact with you. And that's what this series is about. We're in John chapter 1 doing a series called RSVP. And you know our pattern this year. We're just working through the gospel of John, a verse at a time, a passage at a time. I hope you're reading ahead. But in John 1 with his first disciples, Jesus issues five specific invitations. And to highlight those leading up to Easter, we're doing five different styles of worship for these weeks because different music invites people in different ways. We're doing five invitations that we're studying, but we're also giving you five ways to invite your unchurched friend to one of the Easter services. In week one, we said you can pray for them, and you made a prayer card and a list. Last week, I sent you an email that was literally a way you could send them a card. Some of you have responded to that. Others have not. I hope you still will. There's a couple of days open on that. Look for the email I sent you last Sunday, March 11th. You just click on it and fill in the addresses of your friends, and it sends them a personalized card from you saying, hey, hope you'll join me for Easter. Here's this week's invitation. You're going to get an email from me in the next couple of days that's designed, check this out, for you to forward it to any friend you want to invite. All you've got to do is forward it. And when they get it, there's even a way that gives them all the service times, gives them a way to check their kids in early ahead of time. Imagine that, that some of y'all will go to it just for yourselves. It's an amazing opportunity. Look for it this week. Why the big push? Because people are more open to a response, an invitation. They're more likely to respond to that invitation at Christmas and Easter than any other time in the year. Somebody first told you about Jesus, let's tell someone. Somebody first invited you to Westside, let's invite someone. Two opportunities, look for them. Find your notes, wave them at me, you got it? Yeah. Whether you're at Legends or whether you're at Lansing or online or here at Lenexa, you can take notes. Here's the big idea for the series. You ready? Jesus is always inviting us to do life with him. Always. He doesn't stop. He's an inviter. He's the first and the most innovative inviter. He invites us to do life with him, so we should respond wisely. I don't RSVP to a resort invitation. No big deal. I don't RSVP to a party I'm not interested in. No big deal. I don't respond to an invitation from Jesus. Big deal. So we're looking at these five invitations. In week one, it was talk to me. If you weren't here two weeks ago, Brian did a great job of showing us that Jesus wants to engage us to talk about whatever is on our mind. Last week, we did come to me. I hope you remember the, the table set up that we had, the idea that Jesus has set the table, pulled out the chair, and wants to hang with us, wants us to come and experience him, wants to sit down at the table with us. What a thought. This week, it's listen to me. Listen to me. Every parent can relate. You had those moments where you grab your kid by the chin and you get his face about six inches from yours and you say, hey, son, I want you to listen. I'm about to say something that matters. And his eyes have got that glazed whatever dad look on them and you're just wanting him to listen. Jesus does the same thing with us. And in the middle of this first encounter with disciples, they have to learn to listen. And we're going to look today at the proof that we're listening and ways that we listen as well. You remember who we're following here, John and Andrew, two teenage young men, been hanging out around John the Baptist. Jesus shows up one day. John says, that's the one I've been talking about. 
That's the Lamb of God. That's the Messiah. If you want the real deal, there he is. And they begin to follow him and talk with him. And then they go to his house and they sit down and they communicate with him and commune with him. And then, check this out. They go and start telling others what they've heard. Here's the passage. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of those men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and he told him, we have found the Messiah. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, looking intently at Simon. I circle that word intently. I literally picture Jesus just grabbing Simon by the chin and leaning right in and saying, Simon, we we're just meeting, buddy, but this is big stuff. Pay attention. Listen to me. Life change is coming. And then he says to him, your name is Simon, son of John, but you're going to be called Cephas, which means Peter. In his first encounter, God gives Simon a new name, a new identity, a new purpose because he listened to him. I really think how we listen for God is as big a lesson as there is. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now because we're going to literally invite God to teach us how to listen today. Would you join me as I voice that prayer? Jesus, we want to listen to you. There's a lot of voices we don't care about, Lord, a lot of invitations that don't matter, but we want to listen to you. So would you teach us today how to listen? Would you teach us how to know if we're listening? We're leaning in, Lord. In Christ we pray. Amen. I want to start with three proofs that you're listening. Ever wonder if your kids are listening or not? You, think you can actually figure it out. There are three proofs. There's three absolute truths that show we have been listening to God. Here they are. Number one, my behavior changes. Write that in your notes. When somebody listens intently, their behavior changes. John and Andrew, been following John the Baptist. He says, there's Jesus. They follow Jesus. Jesus says, go tell somebody. And they go out, and Andrew tells his older brother. Write this in your notes. What I truly hear will change what I regularly do. What I truly hear will change what I regularly do. Have you had the moment as a parent where you've told your kids for the 26th time, the way you want them to do something, and you know they're still not getting it, and you start wondering, are they ever going to get it? How will you know when they actually heard you when their behavior changes? Until then, you keep saying it. You keep at it. But when their behavior changes, you realize they have heard you. Something has taken place. There is a real proof of that. Look at what it says in James 1. Don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Everybody look this way. If listening would change the world, we'd have already changed it. It's hearing and acting that changes the world. A lot of us have got info up here. We've heard it. We haven't done it. In fact, I'm convinced that if America could be reached by total exposure to Christian truth, we already have it done. It's not exposure that changes us. It's acting on what we know that changes us. It's this idea that we truly listen when our behavior changes. How many of you have ever experienced 110 volts of electricity? Have you done that? It's quite an experience. The only one I've had that's better is 220. Anybody done that one? You can't have an encounter with 220 and not remember it. It's impossible. I mean, you get a hold of 220, it changes you. I now respect electrical things. I now turn off breakers before I work on them. I now pay other people to work on them. I mean, my behavior has changed because of the experience. You cannot have a real encounter with the living God and not be changed. You can't. We've made salvation too cheap and easy. We've made it just believe and nothing has to change. If your life doesn't change, you didn't get saved. If your life didn't change, you didn't have an encounter with Jesus. Now, sometimes the change is slow, but it's there. Many times the change is immediate. 
You know your kids are listening and have heard you when they change their behavior. Our Father knows we have heard him when we change our behavior. The first proof I'm listening well to God is my behavior changes. Secondly, my conversation changes. I love this one. My conversation changes. How does that work? Write this in. We all talk about what we love. It is a natural human tendency. We talk about what we love. I'm going to let you prove it today. And whether you're listening online, you can talk to the screen and not be crazy. It's okay. Now, if you start answering the screen, I'm a little worried about you. But you can talk to it. At Legends, at Lansing, right here at Lenexa, all places, I want you to respond to this question. You've been listening to me speak at Westside for four years now full-time. And for nearly five years before that, part-time. You know me. What do I love? Anybody tell me. What do I love? Cowboys! Woo! Yeah, and it takes a lot of love to love the Cowboys. <laughs> Especially right now. You know what I mean? What else do I love? Grandkids. Grandbabies rock! They rule the world. I just came back from three days in Charlotte with my four-year-old twins. Woo! It don't get any better. That's awesome. What else do I love? The eyes of Texas are upon you. Dude, I'm a Texican. Now, I'm trying to be a Texican, and most days it's working. But I love Texas. I'll tell you about it. I adore my wife. Anybody that's been around me knows that. The stuff that I love. I love tanners. You guys know that. You know I love tanners. Because you can do football and cowboys and wife and food all at once. Wow, it doesn't get any better than that. If you bring your grandkids, you're all in. You know the things that somebody loves because they talk about them. It's not because they, they try to talk about them. Jesus said that which is in the heart comes out of the mouth. Whatever you love, you're going to talk about. You don't have to try. In fact, you've got to try not to talk about the stuff that you love. If you love Jesus and you're really listening to him, you share it. I want to see the picture of this when we get to heaven. But you got Andrew, the little brother, and you got Peter, the big brother. And for the first time in his life, I believe, Andrew has done something before his big brother's done it. He's found Jesus. I mean, I always wonder what he said. You know, he tells us what he said when he went to, to Simon. Hey, I have found the Messiah, but I want to know how he said it. I found the Messiah. Na, 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 na. I mean, was that it? Or, hey, dude, I beat you. I found him. Come check it out. I mean, I want to know how he said it, but he said it. He said it. And the proof that we're listening to God as we share with others what God's doing in our lives, we talk about it. It becomes natural. We sit around the table at home and we say, wow, has God been doing a cool thing the last six months or what? In fact, if you want to start that kind of spiritual conversation, start this way. How are we doing on listening to God? Dan talked about that today. Let's just bring it up. How are we doing? Because we talk about that which we love. You can't have a real encounter with Jesus and not talk about it. There's no such thing as a closet Christ follower. Amen. There's no such thing, guys. We share it. We talk. If you love something, you talk about the something. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. There's another passage I want you to write in your notes. It's Acts 4, verses 13 to 20. Read it later. Here's what it says. It talks about this same Andrew and Peter, these same brothers. Pretty cool. It's now like three years later. Jesus has been resurrected. He's gone back to heaven. These guys are now leading the church. Boy, that's a wild thought. They've been three years as a Christ follower, and they're leading all of Christianity. Is that an amazing thought? And in that setting, they start talking about Jesus, and the authorities in Jerusalem are mad because there's almost a riot around the temple. Every time they meet, the Christians have taken over the temple. So they pull Peter and Andrew in, and they say, you got to stop talking about Jesus. We're in charge here. We can put you in jail. We can exile you. Heck, we can kill you if we want to. You quit talking about Jesus. And their answer is, you do what you got to do, guys. We can't help but talk about Jesus. Jail us? That's okay. We'll just win the jail. 
Exile us? That's okay. We'll just win the folks there. Kill us? That's okay. We're going to pray for you then. We're going to keep talking about Jesus because that is what we have to do. Behavior changes when you listen to God. Your conversation changes when you listen to God. I love this last one. Your perspective changes. My perspective changes. When you begin listening to Jesus, you get a new life. Would you write that in your notes? A new life. I love this. Jesus is just meeting this guy, and he blows his mind. How does he blow it? First, he says, I know your name. Your name is Simon. By the way, that'll preach. God knows your name. God knows your name. He knows everything about you. You think you can hide from God? I mean, I like hide and seek, but from God, you're not going to win that game. He knows. And then he says, I know your name is Simon, but I'm changing your name because I don't see you as Simon, the big burly fisherman. I don't see you as Simon, the big opinionated guy. I don't see you as Simon, the guy that always wins at everything. You're going to be Peter. Peter comes from the Greek word Petra. It literally means the rock. And three years later when he says, Peter, you're going to be the rock on which I build my church, that name change makes sense. I've never really liked my legal name. Danny Ray is a bit redneck. <laughs> Even for me. I mean, you had to be rednecks to name me that, and yes, they are, and yes, I are too. <laughs> but I've had some fun with this. I wonder what God says my name is. Does he call me Peter because I can be a rock? Does he call me Fidel because I'm faithful? Does he call me John because I'm a lover of men? What does he call me? He's got a new identity, guys. And when I start listening to him and applying what he tells me, my behavior changes, my conversation changes, but my whole perspective on life changes because there's a new thing going on. It's just an amazing process. But when we listen, life is different. Those are the proofs. Look at the scripture. Anyone who belongs to Christ becomes a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. It's impossible to come to Jesus without your behavior changing. It's impossible to listen to Jesus without your conversation changing. It's impossible to encounter Jesus without your life changing. Those are the proofs. Simply now, here's three ways we listen to Jesus. Would you write these in as well? Three ways we listen. I want to say this on the front end of this idea. We have complicated hearing from God. It's not that hard. We've made it into a mystery. It's not a mystery. It's really a fairly simple process. When Jesus said you got to become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, to hear from me, to know me, I think he was saying you got to listen the way a kid listens. you got to bring it back down to the simple. Here's three ways we listen to Jesus. First, we listen in prayer. We listen in prayer. There's a whole set of teachings here. We'll come back and do it again. But we've been talking about it in the past. The person who knows the most about the subject being discussed ought to do most of the talking. In any conversational setting you're in in your life, the rule is the one who knows the most about it ought to do most of the talking. When I go to my accountant for help with my taxes, I don't tell him how to do my taxes. If I knew how to do my taxes, I wouldn't need an accountant. The one who knows the most about it does most of the talking. When I go to my doctor, I don't tell him what to prescribe for me. If I knew what to prescribe for me, I'd just go get it somewhere. I let the doctor who knows the most about health do most of the talking. How is it that when we pray, we say, hey, God, here's my list. Da -da 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 Check you later. It's like we treat him like the big Santa Claus in the sky. Here's what I want today. Be sure and fill it. See ya. The one who knows the most about the subject at hand does most of the talking. I really think we've got to get to the point where we simply get still and say, God, I'm going to listen for a while. Speak to me. Is it okay to pray about the list? Sure, he invites us to. But to just rush off like the conversation's done. To sit. I started this practice, this discipline in my life in a new way about a year ago. It has changed everything. 
I literally spend 30 minutes a day on my back porch sitting still. Now, some nights I hear from God. Some nights I hear the crickets. Crickets are okay. About six months into that, my wife pulled me aside one day and said, I don't know what you're doing out there, but keep doing it because I'm getting a new husband. Now, that's the only time I've heard that in 36 years. <laughs> but it was worth hearing. When we hear from God, we change. And one of the ways we hear from God is we listen in prayer. A second way we listen is we listen in the Word. We listen in Scripture. We listen in Scripture. I heard one Bible teacher say years ago, we talk to God by telling Him what we need, and we listen to God by reading His Word, what He's already said. I wrote a book years ago about how to lead churches through change, and I traveled for several years consulting churches. And I'll never forget one church I came to one time. They had bought a case of the books for their leaders, but they had sent them back. And when I got there, they said, hey, we don't really have time to read your book. Just tell us everything we need to know. I did. It's in the book. Well, we don't really have the time to read the book. You just need it. Can you just tell us? I'm going, Really? I mean, I like put time and effort into that book. You know, I, I like kind of said what I really needed to say in that book. Most of it, I believe. Some of y'all get that halfway through lunch. The guy was telling me, I don't have time to read your book. I just want to hear from you. No, he didn't. Do we do the same thing with God? God, I know you wrote me a really cool book here. Mine's got like 2,000 pages. Uh, it's a lot. Could I get the cliff notes? Uh, maybe you could just whisper in my ear in the next 30 seconds because God, yeah, wow, 30 seconds is about all I got. And we expect the Almighty to speak. He speaks in His Word. Guys, get in it. Get in it. There's passages we're giving you every week in the notes for further study. Get in it. We listen in prayer. We listen in Scripture. But here's a way that we don't always listen. We listen in teaching. Write that in. We listen in teaching. Now, I did not say we listen to teaching. America listens to a lot of teaching. A lot of Christian radio, a lot of Christian TV, a lot of stuff available online. There's a lot of listening that you can do to listening. I can listen to James McDonald, one of my favorite speakers. I can listen to Andy Stanley. He rocks. But am I listening in teaching? Am I doing this before I come to the weekend worship? God, I really need you to speak to me today. This is not just an hour I'm going to sit still. I, I kind of need to hear from you. And I've been listening in prayer, and I've been listening in the Word, but Lord, I really need to listen today. And, and, and will you speak to me? Will you take the worship and whoever's speaking and speak? Now, some of you are going, Dan, have you listened to you speak? Yeah, I have. And I admit, it's rough. It may be the saddest moment of my life when I listen to me speak. Two things happen to me every time. First, I say, this guy is a hick. Do you hear his accent? Now, I don't hear the accent when I'm speaking. I hear it when I listen. And I go, "Woo! boy, I need some schooling. But even more than that, I just kind of go, wow, that's got to be a God thing. Because this guy's not that good. My favorite Old Testament story is when God speaks to Balaam through a donkey. And as far as I'm concerned, every Sunday, your name is Balaam. <laughs> he <-aw. laughs> But here's the deal. You come in here hungry saying, God, speak to me. He'll speak through a donkey. You come in hungry, the Scripture says he'll speak through the rocks, through nature, through whatever. He speaks through conscience. He speaks, but he especially speaks in teaching. And if we walk in saying, God, give me one thing today. I need to hear from you just one thing. It may not even be what's in the fill-ins. It may not even be something that I say. It may just be something God whispers in the moment. But when we're listening in prayer and we're listening in Scripture and we're listening not to teaching but in teaching... God speaks. What would happen in this place if we developed the discipline of asking God to speak to us every week and then went out and did what he said? We would change the spiritual landscape of Kansas City. 
The proofs that I'm listening to God, my behavior changes, my conversation changes, my perspective changes. How do I listen? In prayer, in scripture, and in teaching. Here's two listening questions that will change your life. These two questions have changed my life. I've been asking them in, in fireside groups for 20 years. What is God saying to you? I hope that's a question you start answering at the end of every time we have worship. What did God say to me today? Every time you read your word, every time you pray, what did God say? And the second question is even bigger. What am I going to do about it? Because the proof that I've listened is I act. The God of this universe is grabbing you and I by the chin and pulling us up close this morning and saying, I've got something I want to say to you. Are you listening? It's a set of verses there for you to do further study this week. That's not just something I add because I want to fill in the rest of the outline. That actually takes more time for me than preparing the teaching because I literally went through this week and looked at every passage in the Scripture, Old Testament and New, that talks about listening to God, and I pulled out the ones that really spoke to me. They're right there for you to look at this week as well. I want us to pray together for a special need today, and then we're going to be done. Many of you know Pastor Brad Mann. Uh, Brad is our campus pastor up at the Legends location, six feet seven, 225, no body fat. I hate him. <laughs> Brilliant, awesome, phenomenal young man. Five years ago, Brad went through a phenomenal experience with melanoma. Very serious staged stuff. It's a miracle story that he's still alive. In fact, he tells it that way. His doctors tell it that way. Without going into a lot of details, he's now facing a second encounter with cancer. We don't know everything yet. We will know this week. There's some surgery that's going to happen on Wednesday. We'll share more as we know more. It's a totally different kind of cancer. It's pretty unusual for somebody in their mid-30s to have already had two major life-threatening kinds of cancer that are not even the same. But that's what's going on. And up at Legends this morning, they are literally bringing Brad down front, and Pastor Jim Heaton is leading a time of prayer for him in that place, and they're loving on him. We couldn't have him in two places today, but God has him, and we're going to pray for him. So I'm going to reach out my hand just like Brad is here. If you're comfortable doing this, I ask you to reach out your hand toward him as we pray together. This is how we'll close our time today. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, you are the great physician. And already you've written a chapter in Brad's story where you healed him of something miraculous. We're asking you to do it again. Lord, I don't know why this is going. I wouldn't pretend to know. That would make me you, and I'm not you. But God, you are in charge. So I pray you would wow everyone involved, that you would wow Brad with how you heal him, whether that's just miraculous that it's gone by Wednesday when the surgery comes, or Lord, whether that's through the surgery. We don't care. Wow him. I pray you would wow doctors with his spirit and his story. I pray you would wow us all with your grace. We put this man that we love in your hands, Lord. Wow us. In Christ, we make this prayer. Amen. Listen for God this week, church. He's going to speak. See you.